So have you ever noticed, looking back in your life, how you can see God's hand in creating pivotal moments which place you where you need to be to receive his little gifts in answer to a prayer? Meeting Catherine was one of those moments for me. Not only is she a beautiful mother to her five children, but she is fulfilling a call to support the strengthening of other homes and families, including mine. She introduced me to the parent-led education system she founded in 2014. I had been striving to heed a call to homeschool my own five children. I had reached a point where I had nearly lost my courage and resolve to honor my God-given stewardship over the education of my children. She led me to better information and helped me to develop better skills. She helped me upgrade my mindset to a positive and a hopeful outlook on the role of motherhood. She has an amazing gift for speaking to the heart from her own heart. And I am so grateful for her courage and her example. So here's Catherine Spencer. Can you guys hear me okay? Awesome. So it's so fun to sit off to the side and be thinking, who is that person they're talking to? She sounds really awesome. She sounds kind of like me. And then you realize, oh, I'm here. I'm supposed to be speaking. I was getting comfortable. It's awesome. But yes, when you're introduced, somebody is sharing these amazing golden nuggets that are part of who you are. And it's part of what you've earned by going through a finer's fire and experiencing all of what life has to offer. But you don't hear about the struggle, and you don't hear about you know, the shaving off of the corners and the stretching, right? You don't hear about those pieces that that person had to go through to be able to earn the opportunity to be able to be either up here or just speaking to you. Okay, I have to do a little bit of magic with, I have a clicker and a phone. <laughs> awesome. Okay, I can't think of a better pressure cooker environment than looking in the eyes of a brand new baby. This is my um, fourth child looking into her eyes on day one and realizing I'm responsible for everything for her. I'm responsible for all of her physical needs, all of her emotional needs. I'm responsible to have the right spirit around for her. I'm responsible for all of her learning until she matures to the point that she's able to directly connect with her Heavenly Father and be accountable for her actions. Until that point, it's on me. And realizing that really gives you, gave me some pause of if I'm meant to do this perfectly and not make any mistakes, this beautiful little girl's in a lot of trouble. <laughs> I don't know, have you guys ever felt that? So who in this room is a parent? Who in this room would like to be a parent? Right? Oh, a couple still want to be parents. One wants to be a parent that's not there yet. Awesome. Who has some fear wrapped around being a parent? Yeah. I thank you for the honesty. That's awesome. It's so true, right? There's so many things. So hopefully I can share with you some of my golden nuggets that I've been able to learn and gain through quite a variety of experiences in my life. Um, let's see here. All right. So first of all, I realized that this refinement process is not turning us into a hero. A statuesque, perfect, polished, you know, stand in the face of wind and not even have your hair flutter, that is not the point of this refinement that we're going through, right? This refinement is so much different than that. And all that love that we feel for the children that are in our stewardship and all of these experiences where we realize we're not perfect and we make mistakes and things can be really hard, I love that it naturally teaches that the main lesson is that the best thing we can do is really point to our Heavenly Father and point our children to our Heavenly Father that he, he's the one that knows everything. He's the one that loves us enough and loves our children enough to be everything for them. And that's not our job to try to be perfect, right? So you're my five children. It's a few years ago. It's really on us as a family to be the primary, even educators. In the home, that is where the education needs to be happening. And so with all the proclamations and all the declarations, all of the different tools that we have, that's still a huge responsibility, right? And very often in homes, I see it all the time, the mothers will get the answer of what needs to happen first, and the fathers are able to then gain, sometimes through experience, of these amazing things that the mothers know that their children really, really need. So, faithful mothers, yes, maybe charity is more natural for us. It still takes a lot of work, right? It still takes so much. 
So I just want to reminisce on this story that we've all heard. And I'm sure this story will be shared in other talks today with other people and other focuses. But something struck me a little differently recently about this. So these sons of Helaman, they learned from their mothers. They were solid in their relationship with their mothers and what their mothers knew. They don't really talk about, you know, these boys were able to go to war, protect their families, be amazing, because they manned up. Right? Is that what we hear in the scriptures? No. We hear about the amazing relationship of trust that they had with their mothers, and then they were inspired to go and fight for the protection of their families in the face of what looked like, for sure, you're not all going to come back, if you're looking at it in a logical sense. But they had faith. They knew that it would be okay. So for me, this was expressed. This is my son, one of my, one of my sons. His name is Michael. See how cute he is? Like, this is my favorite picture of him ever. My little dirty son, he's on a fishing trip, super cute. He reminds me of Popeye, you know, he's super tough. And then he grows up a little bit. Um, how many of you have kids that have hit that, like, 11, 12, 13 age? Is it kind of rough? That age is kind of rough. And for boys, it's like all of a sudden you've lost all of the golden nuggets you've put into them for just a minute, and you wonder, where did you go? <laughs> What are you going through? And so we hit that we hit that phase. It was pretty rough. We were coming from a completely different education system where my bright, amazing boy, that everyone knew him. I was just Michael's mom. Like, I didn't have anything special about me. I was awesome because I was his mom. And all of a sudden, we hit that 10, 11-ish, and it's like he went away. And he just wanted to sleep all the time. He was really disconnected. Like. It, something dramatically changed. And you know, I've read the books, I understand child development, but we want our kids to be able to progress, right, and grow out of this stage. Like, this is rough, like your hormones are changing, your body's changing, but still, we'd like you to be able to come back to being an active participant in our family, being happy. Well, I had heard the stories, I had read the books, and I was getting messaging of, you know, he is becoming a man and he needs a man's influence. And maybe he needs some more dad time, and maybe he needs that other perspective. You know, maybe you've been too much in his life because you and he are so super bonded. It was like he knew when I was having a hard day without even alerting, like he'd come and be there. When he was a baby, I'd have a nightmare and he'd wake up. Like, we were so close when he was younger. And I thought, okay, well, maybe I need to like step back a little bit and give him some space and make sure that he's having like plenty of dad time. And dad was like, yeah, he needs to man up. He needs to know what it is to be a, you know, a big boy now, you know, he needs to learn these things. And so I kind of gave some space and let dad really step in and do a few more things. And this went on for a few years. And I'd have those little moments where maybe dad wasn't around for a few weeks in a row. And, you know, we'd spend some quality time and all of a sudden it's like I had my son back. There's Michael. There he is. Like, awesome. Okay, oh, well, Dad's back. Okay, I need to, like, defer because, you know, we're a team and, you know, Dad says that he really needs to have more influence. And then I got to a point where I realized my son needed a mom. Why was I not paying attention to the lesson? Like, this lesson is in the scriptures, and no matter how many times the world says, here's the thing that makes sense and here's where they're going, we have a certain role in stewardship. I couldn't fulfill being a dad for my son. That's not my job. That's not my role. That's not my talents. That's not my stewardship at all. But I could be his mom. I came back and just, you know, realized I need to fulfill my calling. I need to go back to being that affectionate, communicating all the time, you know, asking him about feelings, asking about relationships, asking about like what he's excited about and what he cares about and being interested in whatever and being able to be happy and fun and connecting with him, being the mom that I am with him. And you know what happened? My son, first of all, there's this fun visual that happened where he used to be about here for a long time. And now he's here, which is really alarming for me. His voice sounds like a man in my house. He recognizes when something needs to happen that no one asked him to do. He steps in and takes charge. 
when he recognizes one of his little siblings is having an off day or is needing a little bit of extra help, he'll get right down on the ground and help him tie the shoe or help him pick up the thing or say, ooh, mom needs this. I'm seeing that this would help her. Guys, do you wanna help me? This is my 15-year-old son that just turned 15 in December. You know, he'll look around and Janelle, who's here who introduced me, who is basically at my home almost every day, but that's the campus where we have our little community school, right? When there's something going on, whether it's moving rocks or, you know, using a power washer for the first time, he jumps right in there. He recognizes that he's the man of the house, that he can help. He has that ability. He wants to protect the family. He wants to be that good example. He wants to show his love through service. And he is mature. He is strong. We have a little bit of a problem because a lot of the girls think he's really too cute. So that's, that's a little bit of a, hmm. I'm so proud of my son and I am so humbled to realize that the mother's role is such a strong leadership role. We need to really pay attention to what Eve did and pay attention to what the mothers of those boys, those 2000 stripling warriors did. Like we really have a stewardship not to sit back and wait, but to recognize that we can receive revelation on how we're supposed to interact with our individual children and what we're supposed to do in that home. Part of that partnership is us not sitting back and waiting for someone to tell us what to do, but to actively be seeking revelation and guidance of what we need to do. So this mom stuff is not for wimps. Can we all agree on that? We are facing so many things. So I, I wrote this down just to keep it like short, you know, we've got the extremes of war. We've got lust, we've got violence, we've got apathy, we've got a chasm of emotional distance, we've got swarms of noxious distractions, and we've got armies fighting to separate us from our children. Is that pretty accurate of the world we live in right now? Yeah? I am a firm believer that it is harder to be a parent right now than it was generations ago when it was assumed that of course that child should listen to parents before they listen to some random adult anywhere else. Like that used to be the assumption and now it's no longer the assumption. You know, honoring parents is not a cultural thing that you just see everywhere you go. Unless you live in a small town that they still have like old school culture. There are some towns that still exist like this. I haven't ever lived in one. And so for me, it was a huge blessing to be able to have somebody bring me this book the lessons I learned about how important it was to attach with my children and be that strength for them. When this book came into our view, we realized this is the tool. They, those of us that have those nuggets that we've earned through trial and fire, where we recognize the value of being true north for our children, this book totally gives you grace for why it's harder now. It totally walks through the process of what are the things that are really breaking down those relationships? What are the things that are pulling our children away the most? And how do we fix it? How do we rebond? How do we reestablish those connections? And then the evidence that proves and shows through science, which is all fantastic, but the thing that those of us who've been through it recognize, if we are true north, which means we are that strength saying, I love you more than your friend. I will make mistakes, but I love you enough to change what I'm doing, repent, come back to the path, and let you know that I didn't do it right. Let you know the changes that I'm making. Let you know what I'm seeking to do to develop myself. I love you enough to be that person in your life where your friends might be a little bit concerned about how you feel about them, or a lot bit concerned, right? Your friends are not gonna change to be able to be better for you, but your mother will. You know, good parents, we do that all the time, right? How many times do we read a book or go to a talk or pray tear-filled prayers on our knees? How can I gain or change or learn or recognize the Spirit before I open my mouth and try to help in the situation I've never even dreamed of before, right? We're willing to do that because who are we pointing our children to? We're not pointing them to us, right? We're not that statuesque on that first slide. We're pointing our children to our Heavenly Father. We love them enough to not try to hold and not try to be the sources of truth. So, side note, besides for our parents to understand these concepts, anyone who teaches at American Family Education and comes in as a part of what we're doing, I invite them to also read through this and we do a lot of like individual study and check in with these concepts because even a teacher for your children, if you elect to have another teacher 
be there to help inspire your children and be able to guide them, I would hope and I expect in anybody that I'm connected to that they're not putting themselves up as a source of truth for those children. A real mentor says, here is where I'm looking to and I have my eye on heaven and eternity and I am seeking to be going that direction and becoming like my Heavenly Father and so you can learn from the tangible, the modern, the current, the oh five seconds ago I just did this thing, but the whole point is a real mentor and a real parent recognizes that the real examples are housed in our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, getting that concept really, really solid, and if anyone ever bends on that and starts to think that, well, but I have the credentials or I have the whatever, that's okay, but that doesn't work, right? Our kids can check it really fast, right? Have your kids ever noticed whenever you try to say, like, well, just because I said so? Does that work for anybody else? No. My kids, when I say something, and this book talks about the visual of a mother duckling walking through a field. Does she have to go snap at the heels of her little baby ducks? She doesn't have to. They know that she's the source of food and safety and comfort, warmth. They know she's the source. And so they follow her, right? To be able to establish that in our homes where when I tell my children, we're going this way. And I know we've never seen this before. We're gonna go live in a little building on our campus and it's going to be awesome. And we're going to need to like redo all of our own floors and learn how to take care of cars and things that I never had to do before. And we're going to like learn how to mow grass. And we're going to do this. My kids look at me and they go, OK, let's do it. Because they trust me. They trust where I'm going. It's not because I'm the authority. It's because they know this path we've been on to serve other families and to be the kind of family that's learning the things that we need. And they know that I trust them, that if they make mistakes, just like when I make mistakes, it's OK. It's a learning opportunity. It's an opportunity to grow. And we have that together. But they know that I'm mom. And they know that I'm probably spending a little bit more time on my knees praying for them than when they're in the middle of their craziness. And so when I remind them, guys, are you seeking Heavenly Father? I'm seeking His help to know how to help you, but you can be seeking Him directly. They know I'm doing that. They've seen me do it. So this book is not, does not have the key word that is kind of the big deal of what we're going to be talking about today, but it has a term called unconditional love. And that's what he talks about over and over and over. A parent that loves their child can show unconditional love. But what is unconditional love, really? If we really take it to an internal perspective, it's really just talking about charity, right? And aren't we meant to learn charity? The best place we can learn charity is in a home. We're learning charity, which is the pure love of Christ. And I am a firm believer that I haven't met anyone here on the planet, and I am not that person, that can contain pure charity as an element that I created. I cannot love someone enough to be anywhere close to how much the Savior loves you. I can love you a lot. I can really care about you. I can care about you more than my own well-being. But I can't love you as much as the Savior loves each one of you and each of your children. And so understanding that concept, when I think about having charity for my children and showing them the pure love of Christ, it really helps me to take a step back and recognize, yes, this is either hard or this is either awesome, right? Or it's calm. That happens too. Not as often. I can recognize that and say, here's how I feel about that. But until I get to the point where I say, how does the Savior feel about that child in that moment? When I can step back and think, the Savior died for that child. The Savior went through everything and felt everything, and he would do it all over again for this child in this moment. When I can step back into that space, that's when I get to feel charity. But I recognize it's not from me, right? I'm not the source for that. <clears throat> so that has been really helpful in a lot of aspects of my life, but specifically with our kids, right? And then there's a part of charity called true compassion. And I just wanted to mention a little bit, 
when we talk about compassion, a lot of us kind of visualize that whole doormat situation. Does anybody do that when they say like, you need to be more compassionate? And you're like, well, but I don't have time to say yes to everything. I don't have the energy <coughs> to do all of the things people will need me to do. I don't, I don't know if I can do that. And so one of the definitions of compassion is being big hearted, seeing through eyes of others, coming from pure intentions, feeling another person's suffering and spontaneously desiring to help relieve that suffering. That's good, right? Do you guys all agree like that's compassion? It's really good. And that's where I lived for a really long time. I thought I was showing compassion because I was doing these things for a really, really long time for as many people as I possibly could. And you know, we can all be honest, we tend to burn out here and there and get tired and we start to like lose the ability to have that step back and feel charity because we're trying so hard to fulfill our capacity for what we think compassion is. Well, I hope you have a good sense of humor because I found this definition for compassion and it totally brought light and joy to my life, but it, you'll see. <laughs> okay, so this says real compassion kicks tail and takes names and it is not pleasant on certain days. If you are not ready for this fire, then find a new age, sweetness and light, soft speaking, perpetually smiling teacher, and learn to relabel your ego with spiritually sounding terms. But stay away from those who practice real compassion because they will fry your rear, my friend. What most people mean by compassion is, <clears throat> please be nice to my ego. Well, your ego is your own worst enemy and anybody being nice to it is not being compassionate to you. I love that. I saw this little bit of a quote somewhere. It was a little more concise and actually a little bit more crass. But I, I loved it, so I went and I started studying what is real compassion, right? I've been doing a study on boundaries, which is a book we do not have on our shelf. Um, on our table, though, we do have copies of Hold On To Your Kids, and I recommend grab that book if you've ever been or ever want to be a parent. And if you've ever been a child, it will help you understand some things and help you strengthen those relationships in your life. But this concept of true compassion, this was so key for me because, right, when we talked about Eve, that fear of, I know this needs to happen, but, but what if they don't like it, right? What if that makes them feel uncomfortable? What if, what if they say no and they don't want to join scripture study with me because I suggested something different and it wasn't part of what they wanted that day. Oh no, right? But if we're focused on their ego, are we really being truly compassionate? No. We're not running around like cue balls crashing into everyone else's, you know, nicely racked billiard balls, right? We're not slicing up someone's idea of what reality is and saying, look, haha, the pieces are broken. Now you have to examine every piece, right? A little bit of that if you're guided by the Spirit, being brave enough to say, you know what, sometimes we have to break something open and really look at it because I care enough and I feel the stewardship to make sure that this can become better. Having the courage to do that when moved upon by the Holy Ghost, it takes so much <laughs> spirit and attuning our hearts to the way that the Savior guides us to be able to do this all the time has anyone in this room like mastered this all the time? Oh, okay, good, because I was gonna switch you spots. I have not mastered this all the time, but I'm learning and I'm so grateful. And every time I recognize that when I said something and I didn't feel the spirit about that before I opened my mouth with my child, I can tell the effect was not the same. But honest to goodness, we can just show that unconditional love to our kids and show that connection and be there for them. And when we feel guided by the Spirit, have the courage to say what you feel called to say. Change what needs to be changed. You know, take action and Heavenly Father will guide you. I know that each one of you have a mission and a purpose. And you're not meant to do it alone. Even those amazing married couples, isn't it wonderful to be able to have supports and a community wrapped around us where our children can recognize Mom and dad are true north. They love me unconditionally. They are exemplifying the principles that the Savior taught. And when they mess up, they're showing me the repentance process and an increase of love. And they're being guided as they speak. But how strong is that when they can look around to the people you choose as friends, the people you choose as 
whether it's their teachers or the people you're supporting that are around them, grandparents, aunts and uncles, people you're saying, this is our community, this is our family, when they're seeing the same principles being applied in the people around you, that strengthens and that amplifies your ability to have that influence with your children. We need our mothers and our women to recognize that they have this powerful stewardship and this powerful role. But if I could, you're not alone in that. We really do have amazing people. And as you are pray prayerful in what you're seeking to do, it might look like you're going into the darkness all on your own, willing to, you know, all the different things you could do. For me, it was packing up boxes and loading up a truck. But you might feel like you need to do it alone, and it doesn't last. Heavenly Father's right there. There's so many blessings, and there's so many amazing souls that are so close by that want to help. And having our hearts in tuned with the purpose of bringing our children to the Savior and helping build the kingdom, it allows for that connection with other people that could be a part of our life and edify our efforts. So I want to introduce you to a couple of them. For me, so yes, I look like a crazy happy person. I'm so sorry. This is just, I'm not good at taking pictures. But these are a few of the women at my campus, my home, um, American Family Education in Gilbert, Arizona. So we knew this talk was coming, and very last minute I realized, and I am wearing the same clothes, but last minute I realized that would be so great if people could actually physically, like with their own eyes, see that this is not just Catherine Spencer talking about this amazing obtuse thing. Like there are women that gather together and are helping each other become better moms become better wives, they're talking about relationships, they're talking about principles of how can I talk to my child a little differently to help them through this stage. They're seeing children at different age levels, they're seeing each other going through these different classes. We're edifying each other in like a tangible day-to-day -day community kind of way. Our school does not teach doctrine, but we do teach principles of how to function in a higher way. We teach principles of how to unify families and strengthen individuals. And it's been a huge blessing to be able to know that these girls have my back. If my children are outside playing, I know that all of these women are also seeking to do the best they can to have the spirit with them before they give correction, to become more like the Savior, to recognize that each of these children have a divine mission and purpose, and a tender heart that's growing and developing. And we're doing that for each other. We're not all perfect, and we're seeking to do things. Some of these are teachers, some of these are moms. We each have our own stage of life, and yet we're able to work together and have this community. So these guys have been amazing examples to me of their faith to say, I'm going to be the leader in my child's education. I'm going to work together. Some of them have husbands, one of them doesn't, to be able to say, we've got this because we have Heavenly Father. Whatever our children need, we will seek to be enough and then give them over to him so that they can serve their Savior and recognize their mission and purpose.